plasmodium falciparum is one of the most fatal protozoan which causes malaria two types of diseases that are there they are called as the infectious diseases and the non infectious diseases so viral pathogens one of the best common example that we can take of is rhinovirus these sporozoites what they will do is through the blood they will reach the liver of the human being Hello everyone a warm welcome to today's session on chapter 8 of second pc that is human health and diseases i'm dr divya biology faculty vidyashram pre university college mysore temple of excellence so we all know that the health is very important for a human being as the saying goes health is wealth right because you might be quite wealthy and if you don't have a good health how can you enjoy the wealth that you have so therefore taking care of the health is very very important so in this particular chapter we shall discuss about the various types of infectious diseases that are there and what are the preventive measures that can be taken by making some lifestyle changes to prevent these diseases so to begin with let us start with studying about what is health that is the definition of health so health is a state of complete physical mental and social well being of a person so health doesn't mean that you need to have a particular disease any strain that occurs to your body which is preventing you from doing any physical activity or which is causing a problem to your mental stature and also which is affecting your social life all that can also be considered as a ill health so that is why health is defined as the state of complete physical mental and social well being of a person so therefore to maintain a health there are various factors that we need to take into consideration the those being balanced diet personal hygiene and regular exercise all these are very very important if we need to maintain a very good health but nowadays we all have become couch potatoes right wherein we sit in front of the tv don't do regular exercises eat all sorts of unwanted junk foods no proper nutrition available of course you might get nutrition in the form of powders and all that that are available which you can just drink it away but that will not fulfill the natural source that is needed to your body so that is why having a very good balanced diet and maintaining a good personal hygiene as well as doing regular exercise at least for 30 minutes per day is very very important to maintain a very good health and the awareness about disease and their effect on different body functions vaccination which is nothing but immunization against infectious diseases then proper disposal of waste then control of vectors that is those organisms which cause diseases and maintenance of hygiene in food and also in water resources are all very very important for achieving good health so therefore not just personal hygiene nor just regular exercise not just having a balanced diet is enough it is always very very important to make sure that your surroundings are clean prior itself whatever immunizations or vaccinations are available that has to be taken at regular intervals and proper disposal of waste should be done otherwise what happens the whole place will become contaminated with the decaying organism such as the bacteria and fungi causing a lot of diseases so therefore proper disposal of waste is also important and maintaining of hygiene not just maintaining the hygiene that is personal hygiene is important along with that you need to maintain a good hygiene while preparing food that is also very important and also maintaining a good hygiene of the water resources is also very very important so of course we boil water at home when we drink but what about when we use it directly from the tap for other purposes so that is when the government or whoever is concerned with the water resources they have to purify the water and supply to the home so maintaining all these are very very important 
for a good health. Next moving on to diseases. Let us understand what are the different diseases that actually affect the human health. So when the functioning of one or more organs or system of the body is adversely affected, characterized by appearance of various signs and symptoms, we say that we are not healthy, meaning we have a disease. That is true, right? When will we say we have a disease? Regularly, if a person is healthy, we'll feel quite energetic, we'll be able to do all our activities very well with great enthusiasm or interest, right? But when one or more organ in the body gets affected because of certain disease causing organisms, we'll not be able to do our regular activities properly, we'll not be even able to socialize properly. So, and also there will be appearance of various signs and symptoms in our body which will prevent us from being very active until the disease subsides, right? So that is when we say we are not healthy, meaning we have a particular disease. So this is about disease. So what are the different types of diseases? Let us look into. So first let us study about the two types of diseases that are there. They are called as the infectious diseases and the non-infectious diseases. So as the name itself suggests, infectious diseases means they spread from one person to another. Whereas non-infectious diseases are the ones which do not spread from one person to another. So talking about the infectious diseases, the diseases which are easily transmitted from one person to another are called as infectious diseases. And infectious diseases nowadays are very common and every one of us suffers from infectious diseases, right? Some of the Common infectious diseases are the common cold that we get now and then. That is also spread from one person to another. So that is also an infectious diseases. And one of the most fatal infectious diseases is AIDS. Why it is fatal? That is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Why is it fatal? It is fatal because, because there is no cure for AIDS. Of course, the symptoms might be controlled and the Lifespan of the individual might be prolonged to a certain time but apart from that there is no complete cure for AIDS and also it is a disease that can spread easily from one person to another if negligence occurs. So that is why AIDS is one of the fatal diseases and if a person acquires AIDS it means he is inviting all the other diseases that are there. Because what happens in AIDS is the person's immunity completely comes down. Therefore, when he doesn't have enough immunity itself, any small infection, the person will not be able to tolerate, leading to a major effect on his health. So that is why AIDS is very, very fatal or it is disease that leads to death eventually. So non-infectious diseases. So among non-infectious diseases, one of the major diseases that is responsible for death is cancer. Because till date, no cure has been found for cancer. Of course, when the cancer is in the initial stages, there are some radiotherapies and chemotherapies that are available which can be used. But apart from that, in the later stages if it is diagnosed and moreover that is why cancer is fatal because in the early stages the person never comes to know that he has this particular cancer cells in his body. Only when the disease advances and he feels quite a lot of symptoms then only when he visits the doctor the person will come to know and that time there is no cure for it unless the lifespan of the person can be prolonged to some extent that can be done. So therefore ca cancer is one of the non-infectious diseases which does not spread from one person to another but still it is a fatal disease to whoever is affected leading to death. So let's study about some of the common diseases in human beings. So when I say common diseases in human beings there has to be something, some vector right which is actually causing this particular diseases what are those vectors called they are called as the pathogens so what are pathogens pathogens are the organisms which are capable of causing diseases 
So therefore, the disease causing organisms are called pathogens. The different types of pathogens, for example, there are bacteria, there may be viruses. So bacteria, we have the Salmonella typhi, which causes the typhoid fever. Then viruses, we have HIV, that is human papilloma virus, which causes AIDS. Then we have the fungi. Uh, say for example, fungi, we have um, usually fungi, uh, Chlamydomonas. They cause infections to the skin, to the toenails and all that. And there are various protozoans. So protozoans are those which are carried by a different organism. Like uh, say for example, in mosquito's body, there will be a protozoan which gets transmitted when the mosquito bites, leading to malaria. And next we have helminths. So helminths are worms. Uh, like we have tapeworm, we have roundworm, so all these comes under helmet which cause diseases. So each of these one by one we shall take the example and study about it in detail in the coming slides. So the pathogens, they are capable of entering our body through various means. Once they enter their body, they make a body as a host and they start to multiply. When they multiply and increase in number, they start to interfere with the normal, vital, important activities or organs in a body resulting in morphological as well as functional damage. When I say morphological damage, fungi. Fungi causes morphological damage. Why? Because your nails will start to discolor. Sometimes in certain extent, the nails may start to chip off, rot and all that. So leading to morphological differences in the body or morphological variations in the body. Next functional damage can be caused, say for example, we have the hepatitis which causes jaundice, right? So that hepatitis which causes jaundice can damage the liver, therefore causing a functional damage. So th that is how different pathogens can affect the body causing morphological and functional damage as well. So let's study about. So pathogens have to adapt to life. They also need to adapt, right? It is not that they are the ones that are causing the infection. They, so they need not have to do anything. It is not like that. Say for example, there are some pathogens which cause infection in our stomach. And in our stomach, our stomach is acidic in nature, right? Which contains HCL. So if the pathogens have to adapt themselves in such a way that they are capable of residing or staying inside the stomach and causing diseases. So therefore the pathogens have to adapt to life within the environment of the host. Say for example, the pathogens that enter the gut region, they must know a way of how to survive when there is stomach acid. So, and also at a very low pH, how they need to survive and they also need to resist themselves or safeguard themselves from various digestive enzymes and all that that are secreted in the body. So, that is why pathogens also need to adapt to the host organism and nature has designed them in such a way that they are capable of adapting. So that is why a particular pathogen only infects a particular organ and causes diseases. Not all pathogens can cause all sorts of diseases. So that is the one of the reason. So next moving on to studying about different pathogens and what type of diseases they cause. So the first one that we have considered here is the bacterial pathogens. So one of the best example is Salmonella typhi. So Salmonella typhi usually causes the disease that is typhoid fever. So these pathogens, how do they enter into the body? So they generally enter into the body through the small intestine. That is they enter into the small intestine. So how will these organisms reach the small intestine? So if they have to enter into the small intestine, they'll have to pass through the stomach, right? So that is why the Salmonella typhi bacteria should be capable of tolerating or adapting themselves to the acidic and the low pH nature of the stomach. So how do they get into the small intestine? So they enter into the small intestine through the food and the contaminated water that we eat. So that is why always clean water should be used 
water should be boiled properly and then consumed and also the food should be cooked properly even meat especially should be cooked very very well and then only consumed therefore preventing this particular disease that is caused by salmonella typhi so let us understand what are the symptoms of typhoid fever so sustained high fever will be there that is a prolonged fever of 39 degree to 40 degree celsius and the person will have weakness he will have stomach pain constipation that is difficult to defecate then headache loss of appetite that is he'll stop feeling hungry so he lose hunger completely and also there are other symptoms but these are some of the common symptoms that are seen in a typhoid patient and also apart from that if the disease is not treated properly it will cause intestinal perforation intestinal perforation means it will start tearing the intestine or creating holes in the intestine therefore finally nothing can be done and the person will die so death may occur in severe cases so that is why knowing these symptoms first itself never neglect your health please visit the doctor as soon as possible because the google and all that will not help you so always go to a person who knows the symptoms well and who can treat you next diagnosis how can we diagnose the typhoid fever so typhoid fever can be confirmed by a test called as vidal test so vidal test is a particular test that is developed in the laboratory wherein you need to give the sample and through that whether they'll find out from the culture they'll find out what type of bacteria is there so if salmonella typhi is found they'll find out that okay the person is infected with salmonella typhi and therefore he he is suffering from not just a normal fever but he is having a typhoid fever and the treatment can be given next moving on to streptococcus pneumoniae and haemophilus influenzae so these two pathogens that is bacterial pathogens they cause the disease pneumonia we all know that pneumonia affects the lungs even if a common cold is not treated properly then eventually it may lead to pneumonia because bacterial infections can never go away on their on their own if the cold is common cold is caused by a virus then it is not a problem because once it comes to complete its life cycle it the disease will be cured but if the common cold is caused by a bacteria it is always better to get it checked by a professional doctor and then take suitable antibiotics for it so therefore this particular streptococcus pneumonia and haemophilus influenzae they can cause pneumonia disease and this particular pneumonia disease it affects the alveoli so alveoli are the small bulb like structures or the air filled sacs that are present in the bronchial tree of the lungs right and uh, these alveoli they will start getting filled with the fluid leading to severe problems in respiration that is what they say usually they use the term fluid in the lungs right that is what happens in the case of pneumonia the alveoli gets filled with fluid or watery content therefore when watery content gets filled with alveoli how will the proper transport of oxygen occur not possible you have studied about this during respiration in how alveoli is important in the transport of oxygen that is respiration chapter in your first puc right so that is why the particular disease has to be treated very very soon some of the symptoms of pneumonia are fever then chills cough and headache and in severe cases the lips and the finger nails may turn bluish in color gray to bluish in color so why will it turn gray to bluish in color because when the alveoli is filled with water or fluid substance then enough of oxygen will not get stored in the alveoli of the lung therefore no enough of oxygen means no enough of blood the blood cannot carry enough of oxygen therefore when the body doesn't get enough of oxygen our lips nails and all that turn blue so that is one of the major symptoms that can be seen if pneumonia 
proceeds for a longer time and it is left untreated. So this is the symptoms of pneumonia. And how does pneumonia spread? So pneumonia spread, it is an infectious disease. So it usually spreads from one person to another or from the environment to the person it can spread. So a healthy person gets this particular pneumonia infection by inhaling the droplets or aerosols that are released by an infected person or even if that infected person shares glasses and utensils with a healthy person then also the healthy person can get this pneumonia that is why it is always better to have your own set of things and not using others also make sure that it is washed very neatly and then you need to use it. So this is about how the pneumonia spreads. Next talking about viral pathogens. So viral pathogens one of the best common example that we can take of is rhinovirus. Rhinovirus is the one that actually causes the common cold and this does not require any cure because in a week or two they will get the common cold will get vanished. So we are all used to living with common cold right. So that is how, how we have been used to live with corona now similarly because corona is also called one of the viruses itself which belongs to a group of the common cold virus itself. So therefore but unlike common cold corona causes a lot more severe symptoms. So that is the only difference there. So rhinovirus usually causes common cold and they infect the nose and the respiratory passage but they do not infect the lungs. Pneumonia infects the lung and it is a bacterial, it is caused by bacteria. Common cold does not infect the lungs, that is why we do not find any severity in it. Uh, certain home remedies you do at home itself and it will be cured within a week. So symptoms of common cold are nasal congestion, that is blockage of the nose because of the filling of the mucus and discharge of mucus from the nose then sore throat so sore throat is nothing but you will not be able to swallow anything your throat will be in pain and next is hoarseness in the voice so what happens in, during common cold is sometimes during common cold the person's throat may become dry so when the person's throat becomes dry the voice of that particular person will change leading to hoarseness in voice. So hoarseness in voice, then cough, headache, then tiredness which usually lasts for 3 to 7 days. So in 3 or 7 days without medicine or with medicine, if you take medicine also it will take 3 to 7 days, if you do not take medicine also it will take 3 to 7 days because this particular rhinovirus does not have any medicine so far and None of them have bothered to develop a medicine because it is not that problematic to the person. It will get cured by simple home remedies. So by home remedies it will not get cured but at least the symptoms will come to a halt or you can reduce the symptoms so that you can do your daily activities normally. So these are the symptoms. So how do they spread? So they spread from droplets that come from cough or if a person sneezes, infected person sneezes, then also it will spread to another person and um, also it can be spread through contaminated objects such as pens, books, cups, doorknobs, computer, keyboard, mouse, etc. So all these some person would have used. So he might have just touched his nose or eyes. So therefore the virus would have stuck to his hand. So when he uses that object, the virus will move on to that particular object and another healthy person uses that object and touches its nose or eyes or mouth, then the virus will enter into his body and cause common cold. So th that is how this particular disease spreads. Next is some of the protozoans which cause the diseases. So we have Plasmodium vivax. Plasmodium malaria and Plasmodium falciparum. So this, these three pathogens which are the protozoans, they usually cause the disease malaria. And there is one pathogen which is called as Plasmodium falciparum 
So this Plasmodium falciparum is quite dangerous because it causes malignant malaria wherein it spreads to the entire body of the infected person and leading to severe serious conditions which can even lead to death. So therefore Plasmodium falciparum is one of the most fatal protozoan which causes malaria. So the rest two that is Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium malaria they are not that fatal if treated properly at the right time. So let us study about the life cycle of the protozoan because protozoans always cannot infect another person without using a vector or without using a vehicle. So here which is the vehicle that carries the protozoan? It is the mosquito. So that is when when the mosquito bites from one person to from the infected person to a healthy person, malaria spreads because the protozoan would have entered into the mosquito from the infected person's blood. So that is how. So it is important for us to know the life cycle of this particular protozoan that is plasmodium in general. So in general means here it is same for all the three that is plasmodium vivax, plasmodium malaria and plasmodium falciparum. So here what happens is that say for example a person is infected with malaria and that plasmodium protozoan is present inside the body of that infected person. So when the mosquito bites into the body of that infected person to draw the blood these protozoans will enter into the body of the mosquito. Once it enters into the body of the mosquito, what happens we shall look into. So in the life cycle of Plasmodium, what happens here is, here the mosquito, it acts as a vector wherein that mosquito will be the one that will carry the Plasmodium protozoan in its gut and then it will transfer it to another person when it bites that particular person to draw the blood. So therefore, this particular life cycle is divided into two stages wherein one part of the life cycle takes place in the host that is the mosquito and the other part of the life cycle is in the human host. So first let us study what will happen in the mosquito. Now the mosquito has bit a infected person who is having malaria to draw the blood especially the female anaphilis mosquito that is the one which actually bites right male mosquitoes usually do not bite so when it bites what happens the female mosquito will take up the gametocytes with the blood meal so what are those gametocytes the gametocytes are nothing but the gametes that of the plasmodium parasite so that plasmodium parasite gametes or gametocytes will enter into the blood enter through the bloodstream of the infected person into the female anaphilis mosquito when it bites now here what happens here is these gametocytes will undergo fertilization in the gut of the mother so the gametocytes of the protozoan that is there will undergo fertilization in the mosquito's gut. You can see here the egg and the sperm of the protozoans will meet in the mosquito's gut. Why in the mosquito's gut? Because the mosquito when it is drawing the blood, the infected blood will reach the gut, right? What does the infected blood contain? The infected blood will contain the gametocytes that is the male and the female gamete of the plasmodium parasite, right? or plasmodium protozoan. So therefore here fertilization of the male and the female gamete will take place inside the gut of the mosquito and these after the fertilization what happens they will form, a, they will mature. So once they mature what happens during the mature infective stages which is called as sporozoites, those sporozoites will, will escape from the gut of the mosquito and escape in and move into the salivary glands of the mosquito. So now what happened here fertilization and development everything took place. So those developed protozoan that are there those will burst open it will release the sporozoites those sporozoites will move from the gut of the mosquito to the saliva that is present in the mouth of the mosquito and when the mosquito bites a healthy person those sporozoites will be injected into that particular healthy person.
So that is how the infection spreads. Now what happens inside the host we shall look into. Now what has happened? The mosquito which is having the sporozoites of plasmodium has gone and bit a healthy person. Now the healthy person's blood is having these particular sporozoites of the plasmodium protozoan causing the malaria disease. Right. So these sporozoites what they will do is through the blood they will reach the liver of the human being. So parasite sporozoites they reach the liver through the salivary glands blood. So once they reach the liver what they will do is they will again start to reproduce asexually. The parasite will reproduce asexually in the liver cells. And when they start re reproducing asexually, they will start increasing in number drastically. This increase in number will result in the bursting of the liver cells and the parasite will start to get released again into the blood because first they will be in the liver cells. So when they start accumulating in the liver cells, the liver cells will no longer be able to hold them and the liver cells will start to burst. Once they burst, what happens? These particular parasite which has multiplied by asexual reproduction, it will enter into the blood. So in the blood what they will do is, they will again reproduce asexually in the red blood cells and again they will, when they reproduce again asexually in the blood, red blood cells, what happens? Again the red blood cells will swell, it will burst open. The bursting of the red blood cells will take place and therefore it will, when the red blood cells burst, what happens? It will cause a lot of ill effects on the human body such as it will cause fever and also it will cause various other symptoms. And the released parasites in, starts to infect the new red blood cells. That is how the infection continues. It will become malignant. That is why it is called as malignant. It will start infecting. So these red blood cells will obviously move to different organs, right? Therefore, infecting all the organ and if not treated at the correct time, eventually leading to death of the person. So next, after that, it will enter into the, in the red blood cells, in the new, the new red blood cells wherein they enter into, they also exhibit some sexual stages wherein they'll start to produce the gametocytes. That is the male and the female gametocyte will start developing in the red blood cell. Again, this mosquito, when it bites the infected person, the gametocytes will enter and in the gut of the mosquito, the gametocytes will fuse wherein fertilization will occur and then the infective stages stage will be formed that is wherein the bursting of those uh, after fertilization the fertilized thing will burst and then the sporozoites will come out those sporozoites is in the blood of the person infected person now again the mosquito will bite and it will cause the infection again the infection in the host will occur so the, that is how the life cycle of the plasmodium is divided into how the plasmodium survives in the mosquito and how the plasmodium survives in the human host. So this is about the plasmodium protozoan which causes the malaria disease and also we understood what are the symptoms. Fever is one of the major symptoms and how the spread occurs also we came to know. Next let us move into one more protozoan which causes disease which is called as entamoeba histolytica. So entamoeba histolytica causes amoebiosis which is called as amoebic dysentery and the symptoms are constipation that is difficulty in passing stool, abdominal pain, stomach cramps and stools with excess mucus and blood clots and how does it spread? Usually it spreads from one person to another because of the house flies. So house flies here are the mechanical carriers. In the case of Plasmodium, it was mosquitoes which were the carriers. In the case of Entamoeba histolytica, it is house flies which are the carriers. So these are the carriers and they transmit the parasite from the fecus of infected person to the food and when that food product is consumed, by another person the infection will enter into that particular person and also it spreads through drinking water contaminated food by the fecal matter 
all these are the main source of infection that is why wherever the water comes from it is always better to boil it properly cook food properly heat the food properly and then consume so this is about amoebic dysentery next is talking about helminths how these worms actually spread or cause diseases in humans so helminths one of the best example that we can take of is ascaris that is ascaris lumbricoides this is an intestinal parasite it is an intestinal parasite because it resides or it stays or lives in the intestine of the infected host and the disease that it causes is ascariasis and the symptoms include internal bleeding muscular pain fever anemia anemia is nothing but wherein the red blood cells drastically decreases in the body of the person and next is blockage of the intestinal passage why blockage of the intestinal passage will occur because this organism would have made the intestine of the infected person its home and therefore they will not be proper space for the unwanted food digested food and all that to pass through the intestine therefore leading to blockage of the intestinal passage now how these organisms spread let us look into so the eggs of the parasite are excreted along with the fecus so when the infected person defecates then he the infection or the parasite that is the intestinal parasite ascaris will come out through the stool and it will contaminate the soil water plants etc therefore when a healthy person uses these plants without proper cleaning and cooking and uses the water without proper boiling then the infection spreads to a healthy person that is the parasite will enter into the healthy person and will start residing in the intestine of the healthy person causing various health disorders so that is about the helminths and there is one more helminth which belongs to wucheria species that is wucheria bancrofti and wucheria malai so they usually cause the disease elephantiasis which is called as filariasis so this one is a very slow chronic inflammation it is a very slow disease which eventually due after a certain period of time if left untreated will cause inflammation so inflammation of the organs in which they live for many years say for example they will enter into the leg of the person it will cause swelling of or inflammation of the leg of that particular person usually they affect the lymphatic vessels so when they affect the lymphatic vessels what happens because we know that in a body throughout a body numerous lymph nodes are present these lymph nodes are important because they are the ones which drain the unwanted thing out of the body properly now when they, this particular lymphatic muscles get blocked because of the uh, infection by wucheria species then the proper drainage of the fluids or the unwanted things will not take place and it will start accumulating in the lower limb or lower leg of the person the unwanted fluid everything will start accumulating in the lower leg of the person and that will actually cause swelling in the leg of that particular person and the genital organs are also affected resulting in lots of deformities in the genital organs and also deformities in the person as well can you see here the normal leg with that of the infected leg so it is called elephantiasis because the leg actually becomes like a elephant's leg so that is why it is called as elephantiasis and it spreads the pathogen is transmitted from a healthy person from sorry from an infected person to a healthy person by the female mosquito vector so these are also carried by so these helminths wucheria and all that are also carried from an infected person to a healthy person through mosquito bites so that is why we need to take very good care of the mosquito bites and all that next talking about the fungi which causes the infectious diseases so they are the fungi which belong to the genera microsporum trichophyton and epidermophyton 
So these usually cause the disease ringworm. So ringworm is the disease which is caused on the skin of a person. So it actually these fungi they spread because of heat and moisture. So this heat and moisture promotes the growth of the fungi and therefore that is why it, uh, skin is the best place for these fungi because the skin produces heat as well as the skin has moisture also. So that is why it is a very good place for, the musk, uh, for these particular fungi to stay in there and also they are found in the regions between the groin and between the toes and some of the symptoms are the appearance of dry scaly lesions or wound like structures on various parts of the body such as the skin, nails and the scalp also. And apart from having lesions, the person also experiences very intense itching wherever those lesions are there. Now when he scratches on that particular lesion and he scratches a part which is not affected, the infection will spread. So that is how ringworm can spread in that particular person itself and it can also spread to other persons by using the towels of infected persons clothes of the infected person and even comb of the infected individual should not be used. Why? Because this particular ringworm can infect the scalp of the person as well. So that is why always have your own things. So next talking about the preventive measures that can be taken to bring down or to curb the infectious diseases. So one main method is to maintain personal hygiene. If we keep ourselves clean, then the infections are very less. So that is why always we need to maintain a good personal hygiene. So we need to keep the body clean. We need to consume clean drinking water, clean food, clean vegetables that is washed and properly cooked vegetables and fruits etc. Next is by maintaining the public hygiene. So public hygiene is dependent on not an individual person but all the person should, every individual should join hands to keep that particular area wherever he, he is residing clean so that the infectious diseases can be prevented. So what can be done for that? Proper disposal of waste should be taken care of and also proper disposal of the excreta. Then periodic cleaning and disinfection of the water reservoir should be done. Then periodic cleaning of the pools, the cesspools and tanks should all be done. And not just that, also a good hygiene should be maintained in public catering. That is the hotels or any catering services, all these sectors should maintain cleanliness in their kitchen and also while cooking. These measures are particularly very very important to prevent the spread of infectious diseases through food and water. Say for example by doing following all these public hygiene the spread of typhoid, amoebiasis and ascariasis can be prevented because typhoid is usually spread by contaminated water then amoebiasis by contaminated water and food and also through contaminated fecus and ascaris is also through contaminated fecus therefore following public hygiene is very very important and in the case of airborne diseases such as pneumonia and common cold which are caused by pneumonia is caused by bacteria and common cold by a virus along with following public hygiene and maintaining personal hygiene, the infected person should also take care not to give their things to a healthy person so that the infection doesn't spread. So therefore here additional measures should be taken when in close contact with the infected person or their belongings should be avoided. So or it should be properly sanitized before use. And in the case of diseases which are spread by vectors such as malaria and filariasis that are transmitted through insect vectors, then preventing the insect vectors is one of the most important measures wherein we can control this particular disease. So how can these infective vectors be prevented? 
one thing is we need to destroy their breeding places. How can we destroy their breeding places? Because wherever stagnant water is there, say for example in your house you have lots of garden is there wherein lots of pots, flower pots have been kept. That flower pot should be capable of draining water properly. If it is always waterlogged, that simple flower pot can be a breeding place for a mosquito. Or a coconut shell, empty coconut shell, you just put it outside, you don't dispose it properly. That can also collect water and become a breeding place for the mosquito. So that is when we need to take a good measure to keep a surrounding clean so that no way stagnant water is there and, it, and therefore a proper breeding place for this particular mosquito is not available. And this can be achieved by avoiding as I told you by avoiding stagnation of water around residential areas, regular cleaning of household coolers because in the coolers also water is used right. So, at every day the water has to be discarded and fresh water needs to be added. Otherwise, it will become a breeding place for the mosquitoes. And at home, we can use mosquito nets. And whoever is having a pond, like everybody likes the fl lotus flower and it is very pretty to have a pond with lotus flower, right? But what we think, that pond wherein lot of decaying matter is present, it will become the breeding place for mosquito. So, how can we prevent this? It can be prevented by using fishes such as Gambusia in the ponds. So, these fishes usually their diet is mosquito larvae. They feed on the mosquito larvae. So, therefore, completely eradicating the mosquitoes and therefore preventing the diseases. And also, regular spraying of insecticide should be done into ditches, into drainage areas and swamps etc. So, first thing that we need to take care of is however possible prevent stagnation of water around your house and if you have ponds you have you can use gambusia fishes and also on a large scale if that all this is not possible you can always go in for spraying method and all that to curb the mosquito spread. So, this is how and apart from that in addition to that windows and Doors should be provided with mosquito meshes or wire meshes to prevent the entry of mosquitoes into the house. So, all these are available nowadays. So, therefore, we can prevent the entry of the mosquito into the house and therefore the disease. And also various vaccines can be used and immunization programs can be followed to completely eradicate the deadly disease. One of the best example that we can take off is Smallpox. So, smallpox was one such deadly infectious disease that wiped out nearly half the population at one particular time. But because of vaccinations that were developed by Edward Jenner towards smallpox, they were able to eradicate that particular smallpox disease completely. And now smallpox is not at all there because every child when it is born, at a particular time, this particular injection is given. Whether the disease is there or not, a vaccination or a flu shot is given related to smallpox. That is how the disease was curbed. Or polio. Polio also was prevented wherein polio drops are put to children at intervals of time so that the child doesn't get affected by polio. Likewise, there are a number of vaccinations that are available for increasing the immunity in the child against a particular disease. So, therefore, getting immunization and vaccination is very, very important. And there are a large number of infectious diseases like polio, diphtheria, pneumonia, tetanus. All these have been controlled by vaccination. As I told you, for example, tetanus, we have the TT injection that is available. So, pre or itself, if the TT injection is taken, then the person can be prevented from getting tetanus and the discovery of antibiotics and various other drugs also have enabled us to treat infectious diseases. So, the best example we can take off is corona, right? How a corona virus vaccine 
was developed and that has been given to nearly half the population of the world. That is why Corona, Corona has not gone, the virus is still there but the symptoms the people are developing have drastically reduced and people are now able to live their lives without much fear. So you can imagine a year back how, what the situation was and how the situation now is. It has changed. So therefore, thanks to various discoveries that were done on vaccinations, flu shots, etc. So this is the different preventive measures that can be followed to curb various infectious diseases. So I hope you understood this session well, wherein we learnt about different infectious diseases and how, how to prevent them. And in the next coming session, let us learn about immunity. Because every person has a set of immunity in his body, right? What is that immunity? We shall look into and what are the antibodies? What is antibody? We shall study about it along with the structure of the antibody. So we shall meet again in the coming session with these two topics. Thank you.